Okay. Hello, Dr. Schwartz. How are you? I'm good, Douglas. Thank you. How are you? Good. Very good. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. So you've got a book out called The Secret World of Stem Cells, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. There were, years ago, there was some controversy over embryonic stem cell research. I have not heard people complain about that in decades, but what exactly was the complaint with that? Well, the issue was basically mainly of ethical nature, um, whether or not people should be allowed to use embryonic tissue. And then if you go that route, of course, you, you are concerned whether um, embryos are used basically for research purposes. For that reason, um, embryonic stem cell therapy or research is not allowed in the US or in any other country in the Western world, at least, as far as I am I know. But I know there's people who want to do embryonic research. I'm completely against it because I still believe it's unethical and it's unnecessary. Um, cells from umbilical cord and from placenta tissue, which is close to basically the potency, if you wish, of embryonic tissue. So whatever can build an entire human being, um, what is in the placenta and umbilical cord blood, as you can imagine, is, is very potent material. And that's much more potent than um, the stem cells we as, as adults later in life uh, still have in our body, in our adipose tissue, in our bone marrow. So the book, you're talking about actually a type of treatment that can be used, uh, that stem cells can be used for, regenerative treatment. Is that correct? Well, the, the whole uh, topic of stem cell therapy deals with regeneration, or what we call nowadays regenerative medicine, which is in contrast to reactive medicine, which we usually use. Uh, people come to us because of symptoms and signs of diseases. I'm a cardiologist, so I see patients all day long with heart diseases, for example, and we react towards those symptoms and try to deal with the damage of heart tissue or blood vessels. In contrast, in regenerative medicine, which is, in my opinion, the future of medicine, we don't want to react, we want to repair. We want to repair that damage. And that's where stem cell therapy comes in place because stem cells have uh, evolutionary, basically the task to repair damage. So if you look at certain um, animal species, reptiles, for example, if you cut off the entire limb of a salamander, they can regrow that entire extremity because of an abundance of stem cells. We have this in utery. We, uh, as humans, for the first uh, weeks of life, if we lose an arm, we can rebuild that in utero. But um, later and, and after birth, we lose that ability but the uh, potential of stem cells is there. And that's what we are using in research in clinical studies now. And all the studies which have been published in different conditions, whether it's for heart diseases, for vascular diseases, for chronic degenerative brain or neuron diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's or dementia, uh, have shown enormous benefit. So I'm curious about the process of this. Um, if you have somebody comes in who maybe has heart damage, has valve damage, uh, you're suggesting that stem cell therapy could regenerate the heart valves and that surgery would not be necessary? Well, it depends, of course. Uh, at the current time, stem cell therapy is not FDA approved. So everything we are doing is in the frame of clinical studies right now. But to answer your question, absolutely. There is studies, for example, showing that we might be able in the future using stem cells to replace our degenerative electrical system in the heart. So an hour ago, for example, I had to uh, place a pacemaker on a patient who had what we call a complete heart block. It's a mechanical device, as you probably know, um, which goes into the chest with the electrodes in the heart. But in the future, we might not um, need to do that because there's early studies showing now that there's a potential of stem cells to regrow electrical cells in the heart. We're not there yet. Similarly, um, I'm a transplant cardiologist, so I deal with 
people who need a heart transplant, but there's a lot of people who cannot get a heart transplant because they are too sick or they have multimorbidities or they're just too old. Um, there is no age limit if you wish, but if someone is close to 80, then a transplant is not really an option. But those patients have symptoms uh, if they have a weak heart and end up in the hospital every month. And we have done several cases, I've seen several cases of individuals who had stem cells in the frame of clinical studies, and they did extremely well. We didn't cure their heart failure. Uh, we didn't improve their what we call ejection fraction, which is a measure of the contractile strength, but we did improve their symptoms. We did improve their cardiac capacity, meaning the physical activities they were able to do compared to with the treatment before and without the stem cells and also compared to placebo controlled uh, people. But these are all small studies. That's We're just in the early stages looking into the potential of stem cell therapy. I know that uh, for transplants, for organ transplants, there needs to be a DNA match that you can't put a kidney from somebody in without a, a proper amount of DNA matching. Is that the case with stem cells? Like, or can you use anyone's stem cells for anybody? Well, that's a very good question. And it really depends who you ask. In general, of course, if you give any cells and theoretically you should at least have some match of the blood type and maybe even look at HLA and antibodies basically. But with the stem cell therapy, the way we are using it in the frame of clinical studies, that's not the case for several reasons. Number one is that those cells have a very low antigenic potency, meaning they are very weak in inducing antibodies. And even if it wouldn't play a role at the current time, but it could play a role in the future if that particular patient who gets IV stem cells in the frame of a clinical trial, in 10 years from now might need a kidney transplant. And if he had produced antibodies against those cells, which is a blood product from a foreign individual, basically from a no, not the same person, but from someone else, <clears throat> and they could create some antibodies. On the other hand, we don't have this problem anymore because we don't use cells. We use the ingredients of cells um, with, with all the potency of the stem cells, but without the cell membranes. And the cell membranes are the portions of the cells which have the antigenicity. Basically, without the membranes, there is no immune reaction, there is no antibody production. And for that reason, to answer your question, there is no need for any immunosuppression and there is no need to basically have a, a DNA match or an HLA match or even a blood type match at this point. Uh, I also see on here that the stem cell therapies could be used for anti-aging. Is that right? What? Well, I'm not, uh, Douglas, I'm not a big fan of that word if, from a scientific point of view. I think it's unscientific. On the other hand, I mean, look, there, there's a reason why the biggest companies in the world, Google, Amazon, Apple, among others, spend hundreds of millions of dollars since six, seven, eight years now on anti-aging um, research, and that includes um, stem cell therapy. On the other hand, I'm in Los Angeles, so I mean, we have a lot of people you see usually on camera and on the red carpet. What do you think why they look so flawless, 20 years younger than they are, and uh, beautiful skin? <laughs> of course, they come to us um, and have stem cells injected in their face because it does rejuvenate the superficial epidermal layers, the skin cells basically, and after a few days, People glow, they, they look younger, they look more fresh. There's improved circulation in the in the superficial skin layers. So there is something with regard to that so-called anti-aging mechanisms and stem cells might play a major role in the future here. Okay, do you think that's actually a positive thing for society to have people living to 110, 120? I mean, is that gonna create more problems than, than it's gonna benefit society? I wrote that in, in the book, of course, in part, um, uh, th that issue in the secret world of stem cell therapy, which just came out, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, we don't intend to prolong just life. What we want to do as physicians and researchers, we want to prolong health span. 
So uh, just a numerical life extension is of course uh, useless and, and counterproductive because uh, what, what are we creating? Frail people who are not able to move and are immobilized. We don't want that, of course. We wanna increase the health span. And how do we do that? By recognizing nowadays that um, most of the diseases are really caused in part at least by advanced ages. So the diseases I'm dealing with as a cardiologist are age-related degenerative diseases of the blood vessels, of the, the heart cells, the heart tissue, the brain tissue, among others. And um, keep in mind, there's 100,000 people every day dying of advanced age. So if we recognize that there's different forms of, of aging, and aging with degeneration is considered a disease, then of course we wanna treat that in order to improve the health span, to enable people not only to survive heart attacks, what we are doing already right now, but also to live a more productive and, and healthier and um, a happier life until high ages. And that's the goal. You had mentioned that uh, stem cell treatment was not FDA approved at this point. Is there political support for it? Well, there is some political support, but <laughs> there's not enough political support. So number one is that, of course, we are still lacking a lot of data. We, we, there are so many unanswered questions now. We don't know which type of stem cell is the best one for which condition. We don't know the exact doses for certain conditions. We don't know how often, if, if at all, we have to repeat that. Do we have to do that once a year? We have patients coming for hair loss. They come once a year, for example, for stem cell injections. We have others with um, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, for example, they come once a year um, for injections into the spine. But again, that's all considered experimental. That's not routine therapy. And there's no insurance company paying for it. So what is missing are large scale clinical trial data. And in order to do those, of course, you have to spend a lot of money. If you wanna create a new drug, for example, that costs a minimum of $100 million and usually takes 10 years. Um, and the stem cell world doesn't really have much money because big pharma, for example, is not much interested. So most of the clinical studies, when it's about new devices or new therapies or new medications, they're sponsored by big pharma companies. But in the stem cell world, there is no, no lobby, not much at least. And all the data which are... Uh, created basically stem from small research grants, and that's where we are lacking political and financial support. Okay, so it all comes down to money, basically. All right, doctor. Well, listen, we've got to wrap this up. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, my guest is Dr. Schwartz, and his book is called The Secret World of Stem Cells. Is the book available now? Everywhere, yeah, it just came out uh, this month. It's available everywhere, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, Target, Walmart on their websites, yeah. Okay, do you have a website you want to give out? Yeah, it's uh, www.drfonschwartz.com uh, or you can just Google Ernst von Schwartz or Dr. Ernst von Schwartz and find me. And there's also a lot of information about the book, yeah. The book is, by the way, is for the consumer. It's not for the medical health uh, professionals. It's for the consumers who are interested and who really want to know what are the scientific facts and where we stand, rather than uh, relying on, on advertising on the web, which is uh, misleading. Well, thank you again for coming on and uh, best.